The city of Nottingham as it's going to be in 2094, well, none of us know exactly what it's going to be like in 2094, so this is a kind of thought experiment. But I see it as silver because in the scenario I've written, the Gulf Stream, which as we know is, is responsible for our climate being relatively mild, uh, fails, which it may well do. And so the temperatures are going to be more like Canada now. So it's silver because the Trent freezes and floods every winter and people skate on the ice and it's very beautiful. Uh, there's a lot of green in the summer, a lot of water, becomes a water city in my scenario. The Silver City in 2094 is full of activity, a lot of it taking place on the waterways. Uh, there is the Colour Works, which is a place where colours are mixed, uh, inspired by the octopus, and they have a dyeing factory and produce beautiful flags and other textiles. And uh, weather is extremely important as a weather forecasting system, which is extremely in intricate and not based on any of the technology we use today. It's actually going much deeper into old weather law. And there's a radio system where information is passed along, much like it would have been uh, since the beginning of radio, the old days of radio. Uh, and there are lots of activities that people who live in pods, they live in groups, or families or pods, can join in. There's a temple and there are masses of uh, rituals and celebrations and uh, events that take place there, a lot of communal eating. It's a very joyous place, but it has been a very hard one joy because as I chart in the story that leads up to 2094, there have been some terrible things along the way. And many of Nottingham's residents, the Silver City's residents, have very dark stories to tell about how they came here. When we were planning this project, it seemed to me important that the date in which we would posit that this exhibition was set should be within the lifetime of any child born today or any child alive today so that it's not so far into the distant future that people can't imagine it because we do have a problem with our imaginations when we think forward we're very good at looking back because we've got history to give us all sorts of clues and cues about what went before but we're not particularly good at looking forward the invitation of this exhibition is to fast forward, throw your imagination forward into a time, actually it's not that long from now. It's really not that long from now. Um, I'm old enough to remember 50 years ago, a little bit more than 50 years ago, and I've seen the huge changes that have taken place in the world in that time. So all we have to do when we have children is cast our minds forward and think, well, of course there are going to be massive changes. And I do suspect, unfortunately, these changes are going to come, become very rapid and we're going to be reeling quite a bit in the years to come, especially given the disastrous um, outcome of, of COP26 recently in Glasgow. Uh, we are in for a very rough ride, but that doesn't mean to say that there isn't a lot that can be done along the way and, and that our children and grandchildren shouldn't have happy, fulfilled lives. They'll just be very different from what we imagine them to be now. This is the first time I've done anything like this um, and it's been very exciting to work with the artists and to hear their visions and to work out how I could fit their visions into my story or build my story around their visions. Uh, some of the exhibits that you'll see here, like there's a trilobite which uh, appears in one of the stories and uh, I think there's a shark's tooth as well and the colour works that I mentioned in, in one of the later stories is drawn from Celine Condorelli's work uh, with, with the octopus and, uh, and futuristic uh, colour techniques. Uh, I've also included uh, the temple, which is a very important part of Grace's work, and uh, the, the weather forecasting. I have a whole character in the, in the later part of the story who is, she's a weather forecaster. And, 
and that's her role and she's, she's learnt the techniques that Femke has learnt about in order to produce her work. I'm, I've thought long and hard about what art can do in the face of the climate and ecological emergency and sometimes I feel very depressed about <laughs> the limits of art but sometimes I feel very excited particularly when art is combined with activism and I think that social movements happen slowly and then very very fast so as we've seen before with any kind of revolution things can change rapidly opinions change rapidly uh, the way people live their lives, as we've seen from COVID, COVID can change very rapidly. So I'm actually, I'm actually quite hopeful, and I also believe that if if we have a duty to stay hopeful, you know, if we're if we're bringing more children into the world, um, we have an absolute duty to make sure that this world that they're inheriting is absolutely worth living in, and that they will find it a joyous place despite all the difficulties that there will be. I think it, when it comes to art in the climate and ecological emergency, all of us writers and artists and musicians for that matter who are thinking about the times we're living in, we are all ecological artists. We are all thinking about the backdrop to, to our lives, not just today but tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. I think it's, it's going to become something that is truly going to absorb us more and more. And, uh, and I think a lot of exciting art will come out of it and ideas and also action. I think uh, the way I feel about hope is that there's no point being hopeful if you don't do anything about it. So I'm a great believer in action. I'm part of Writers Rebel, which is an affiliate of Extinction Rebellion. And we encourage other, other writers to write, to speak out, to do all they can um, in this, in this extraordinary time, a time like no other with challenges like none that have come before.